Hey guys, it's Chris. I'm back with James from Daily Use of Sports Trivia. And this is going to be our series on Jon Snow, his end game potentially, and we're gonna call this A Dragon Raised by Wolves. So this is going to be part one. And just to kind of lay this out for you, what we're going to do is do four parts of this discussion, a lot of speculation and yeah. theory crafting perhaps and that type of thing. And what we'll do is do a Q&A in between each one. So you guys can leave your questions for this video in the comments and then we'll answer those in the next Q&A. And feel free to leave, you know, season seven questions in there and stuff too. Heck yeah. So we'll do a Q&A in between each of these. So for the next eight weeks, we'll have some content coming as far as Jon Snow, his end game and Q&As in between those. So. They thought we were off for a week but we have been brainstorming so yes. much for you guys. we did take a week off from actual filming i yeah. actually did a gaming video on my gaming channel and a little video on green screening on because views my other channel from behind the scenes that me and val from because geek and Tacoa. so uh i wasn't really off but we did take a, a week off from god okay so what we want to do here is talk about basically what's the real importance of Jon Snow, right? Right. We know now that he is the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. There is no more debate about it. it right. There's no more Ashara Dane theories. There's no twin theories It's going to work. This is going to be the same in the books, more than likely. I don't see them having something this big as a plot point being different in the show and books. No way. HBO actually did release a graphic of showing that Rhaegar was the father since people still were confused after Thank the episode. God. Yeah, because people were still. Right. They didn't really name Rhaegar. Um, so... But I guess let's lay out the premise here. Yes. You know, a lot of people say, you know, Jon Snow is ice, Daenerys is fire. But if you think about it, if there's any symmetry to the story, and not that everything's got to be perfectly symmetrical, but in the overall scheme of things, Jon Snow is not ice. He is not. Danny is fire. The Night King is ice. Yes. Jon is both. I do think Jon being the song of ice and fire, Stark and Targaryen... Obviously, he's got a Targaryen connection directly, so we have to now assume, or at least speculate, that mm -hmm. the ice side of things, that the Starks have to have a connection to the Night King. Right. Like Old Nan said. Right. Old Nan said that the Night's King was probably a Stark of Winterfell. A lot of people speculate that could have been originally Brandon the Builder, mm -hmm. the actual guy who raised the wall, who helped raise Winterfell, and possibly <clears throat> Storm's in. So there is some question about that, but there's, you know, we have this... Northern ice magic, right, or, or yep. nature magic, or whatever, with the warging, etc. And so there's another layer right there, right. You got the, the magical side of things. You know, his end game, whatever it is, is it's got to be magical. It can't just be a story about a bastard or a guy who thought he was a bastard. He still may be a bastard. We don't know that they were married. Right. And he just comes up through the world despite being a bastard. And yeah. then, you know, makes his way through the Night's Watch ranks, becomes Lord Commander. He gets killed for doing the right thing, comes back to life, which is a pretty big deal, and then ends up King in the North. Despite being a bastard and all that, that's not what this twist was about. This no, was not, that's not his about end being game. A... His end game is he has to somehow either help end the battle between Ice right. and Fire by what? sacrifice himself is his role more uh peacemaker where are you leaning yeah in that? and that's that's kind of the question right is you know what is he going to do i mean and how is he going to do that well if he's just if he's just a, a, the son of ray and liana yeah and he's just okay big deal right what does that actually mean we know that there's two houses that have magical dna targaryen slash valyrians stark slash first men slash children of the forest Okay. He has both of those potentials. In the books, he is a warg. Yes. He just resisted. In the show, they didn't make him a warg at all. So it kind of makes you think, all right, if he's a Targaryen and a Stark, a lot of people won't brand a warg a dragon. You would think that, well, Jon could be the one to do that because he has an affinity for dragons as a Targaryen, has all those Targaryen traits. Maybe they're just not out yet, so to speak. Yeah, we haven't seen him in the presence and, of one. And he can warg in the book. So you would think if there was some kind of magical thing going on, it would be him, not necessarily Bran. Now, I'm not saying that's his end game. I'm All just saying right. as the magical side of things come about, if you think about the fire side of things. All right, Targaryens, Danny. So they have an immunity to heat, apparently an affinity for dragons and, and dragon lore and all that kind of thing. And then the next level of magic there where Danny can hatch dragon eggs requires blood. 
Yes. On the ice side of the world, right, you have, you know, wards and the skin changers. They can warg and they can skin change just by learning the ability by apparently, like, for example, the Stark children. They, you know, got dire wolves, which yeah. Blood Raven sent. They were then able to unlock that, those abilities via the dire wolves, being close with the dire wolves, just like a Targaryen would be close with the dragon. Mm-hmm. But then the next level of that kind of northern ice magic, or whatever you want to call it, requires the use of weirwood trees. And what do they work off of? Blood. blood. So the key here is John has the blood of ice and fire magic both. And so whatever he's got to do, whatever it is, whether it's being a sacrificial lamb, peace treaty, or actually winning a war some way, shape, or form, it has to be magical. Using, using both sets of uh, magic powers he's born with, Right, using the potential he has in his DNA yeah. for the fire magic side of the world and the ice magic, warging, skin changing, whatever side of the world, he has both of those in him as far as potential goes. So he is the key. The question is again, what does that really mean? So let me ask you this. All right, you've kind of laid out what you're saying here. Now what I want to ask you is, is he ready? to unlock this because he's more comfortable with the ice uh, side you're talking about. He's right, not, right. He's not aware yet that he has... He has no idea. He has no idea that so he's a Targaryen. Is, do you think this is where those kind of outlier players we were talking about, Bran and Sam, right. come in? I, I think so. I think that's what you got to think about, too. It's not just that, okay, you know, Night King, Danny, John in the middle, if you look at like an, uh, some kind of graphic or something with yeah. symmetry there... You got to consider these other players. Brand's importance, Sam's importance. So, in a in the big scheme of things, I think they're both big players. And then, is there any other players on the fire side? I guess you could say on the fire side. Yeah, I mean, for example, yeah. Brand is an ice child. You could say on that kind of side of if you had to kind of split the players up right on a on a graphic. Yes. You know, you would have Brand over here in the ice side of things because he has all those northern abilities. He's a Stark, etc. You have Sam, who's not anything special as far as bloodlines other than being a Tarly in ancient house yeah but he's in the citadel learning something of importance he's not there for no reason no way now are there any people in our story that would be like in Danny's camp if, I if think that makes Tyrion sense? I'm guessing Tyrion yeah Tyrion would be one right because um, you got the Targaryen Tyrion you know theories and there's a lot of evidence to support that and I'm kind of not 100% there yet but I lean towards it now because there is a lot of, of speculation, and especially after seeing in season six when Tyrion let the dragons loose. And I know that's the show and that's not the canon, but it's still based off the books that yeah, may still happen in the books. It may still happen in the books, and that's right. just because he didn't tear his ass up is a huge hint that he may in fact be the Mad King's uh, son and Danny's half-brother. And what about Varys? Varys comes in it too, right? In the books, um, it, uh, you know, it's implied that there's something more to him than just being a guy who wants a Targaryen restoration, or in this case, possibly a Blackfire restoration. So I think people like Varys, you know, he, I think he's a Blackfire myself because he supports Aegon in the books, which is a completely different character that's not in the show. But Aegon in the books has already landed. He thinks he's Aegon Targaryen, the one <clears throat> who survived King's Landing, would be, you know, Rhaegar's son. But I don't think he really is. But remember when we were talking about this the other day and I was taking notes and right. I was writing all these names down and you said, for shits and giggles, I want you to look at his name and tell me what you notice about it compared to the other names. And it jumps out at you a yeah, little bit. Varys, right. Yeah, Varys, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. It it's, it's more of, you know, it's got a Y in it, number yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. It's got a Y in it. And, and it's just more like, you know, Daenerys, Viserys, Varys. You know, yeah. it just kind of fits that kind of... Targaryen or Blackfire or Valyrian type name. Right. So, I mean... And we know what side, what camp he's aligned with anyway. Right. I mean, he's on the boat right now. Right. So, you know, you got to look at the other players, you know, and, and how they fit in. So, with John, I think that, you know, in, in the overall scheme, whatever it is he has to do, I think Bran's got to... Because, you know, Bran's going to see things. He's going to warn John of things. He saw his birth. He, he'll probably be the one being involved, at least, with telling him of his, you know, dragon side. I, I believe that. So Sam is in the Citadel. He can't see any of that. He may find some record there in the Citadel about his birth and about who he is. 
But what I think is going to happen is if you look back at the last hero, okay. all right, or as far as what John's got to do, start to speculate is, on what the end game is. That the is. one with the Lightbringer sword? Yeah, the last hero is, you know, we don't know exactly how this happened, but apparently he was the last hero who had, you know, the sword Lightbringer. He forged it through the heart of his lover after a hundred days and trying two other different times to, with, to try to forge it in water and try to forge it in the heart of a lion. The third time was a hundred days and then Nisa Nisa, his lover, mm-hmm. wife, whatever, and all her fire and spirit, soul, whatever, went into the sword and it became Lightbringer. But it never says anywhere that he beat the White Walkers or he killed them all. Obviously he didn't kill them all, Obviously. they came back. So he went off with 12 companions and a dog so the that big means 13 people. The big 13 again. 13 yeah. is going to be a recurring theme here in this discussion, I think. And went off, and the, eventually they all died, but he went looking for the children of the forest to get their help. Okay. And after whatever happened, then they drove the White Walkers back, defeated them, whatever that means, and then they built the wall, etc. And I think whatever he did, John's going to have to do too, and Sam could be the one to find the records of that somewhere where, where it's written down what he actually did, what he was going after, what the children helped him with as far as the uh, Battle for the Dome. And a lot of our conversation the other night, um, we were talking about what event undid what he did. And we have been really speculating. Another piece of this is what are the White Walkers reacting to? Right. Because they came back for a reason, and I started to speculate in a couple other videos, could they have reacted to John's birth? Could they have reacted to the Mad King killing Brandon Stark and Rickard Stark as far as them going oh. to get Lyanna released where a Targaryen killed a Stark? Wow. Was there some kind of ancient pact of ice and fire? Wow. You know, something, some kind of event, you know, that happened where the you Night King... You that one for me. You, you didn't hit me with that the other night. This is That's new <laughs> for me. I like that. Right, right. So, I mean, it's something that they, you know, because we know that they can see Bran in a vision. So they exactly. have magical ice abilities or nature abilities based off the children's magic. So something caused them to come back with a fury. I don't think it takes 8,000 years to build an army. I think something recently before, before our story started had them coming back and start to build their army because a lot of people said it was the hatching of dragons. Like, you know, there can't be dragons in the world or we're going to come back and wipe everything out. Right. But they were back before the dragons. They were back before. Now... There was another event at the uh, that where Aegon the Fifth Targaryen became infatuated with the dragon eggs he had, which was egg from the Duncan Egg novels. Oh, okay. And the tragedy at Summerhall, and apparently they were trying to hatch dragon eggs and end up burning the place down, and a lot of people died, including a lot of Targaryens. Now, could that be an event they reacted to, where they somehow sensed or knew that somebody's trying that to bring they were back. trying to bring dragons back, and then that made them start, you know, marching towards the wall and, and building their army, etc. And it just took those many years for Craster's sons to be White Walkers and to find little wilding groups that were still separated. They wasn't completely under Mance Raider at the time by any means, and then start building their army and, and marching south. For my, um, for me, I need you to tell me again how long. Has it been since, since that last hero or whatever? Uh, about eight thousand years. Okay, eight thousand years ago, the wall went up, and okay. that's that's when whatever happened happened. They were driven back, obviously not killed again, and then they raised the wall. Well, Supposedly, my thoughts are this, and you tell me what you think. It can't be the hatching of the dragon. Ha- can't have anything to do with dragons no, because no. you said they were around just a few hundred years. Yeah, right, exactly. And that was my counter to that argument about yeah. the Summerhall thing was that dragons existed up until about a hundred years or so before, uh, our, before story. our story started. There was an event called the Dance with Dragons, the Targaryen Civil War, that really dwindled their numbers down. Then, of course, they had them in dragon pits and kept them in captivity. Okay. And that's what Tyrion kind of hinted to us in season six when he was said dragons don't do well in captivity, that that made them grow smaller and weaker and die out eventually, and they couldn't hatch any more dragons. So the damned. magic kind of went away in the world, too. That was kind of waning at the same time. So there, there's something that they're See, reacting yeah, to. Yeah, if, if we wipe out the dragon theory, okay, then next theory of what they may be reacting to, you said... John's birth. Right. I mean, I'm thinking 
with the timeline, and I know we have other things we're going to bring up, but I'm just saying let's go yeah, with that with, one right, right now. Let's see so, what you so think. So with the John's birth thing, he was 14 years old when the show started. Okay. Or the, and the novels as well. In the show, he's a lot older. They, they aged everybody up. But as far as the novels, when the story started, he was 14. Yep. So to me, that sounds like a pretty good amount of time for Craster to give up a bunch of you know, male children yeah. for them to become white walkers. Yeah. Now, we don't know how that works. When they turn a white walker by touching its cheek, does it immediately grow into a white walker or does it still take, you know, 15 years to become an adult or whatever? And, you know, so we don't know how that works, but that would build up the white walker army. And that leads me to the idea of their reproduction. You know, why exactly. is there just male children being sacrificed? Is that the way they have to reproduce? And, of course, that goes back to the story of the Night's King. So, let's say he keeps them all pregnant. Basically, all the time, somebody's pregnant. Somebody's pregnant. Right. For 99 of these things to have been put out there and taken, because there's a 50-50 chance that it's going to be another daughter, right? Right. Okay. So, you know, a lot of time could go by. Right. So, some of those first kids could have been older. And then, like you said, maybe when they make them into one, they age faster anyway. I'm just, that's just, I'm trying yeah, to think and that's logically. The, that's the thing. I mean, if you think about, if we're going off the John's birth idea of them reacting to that or coming back because he was born, then you got to think that Craster, you know, he probably, people don't live to be very old in this world. True. He's had time to have 99 sons. And like you said, you know, we don't know, you know, what how that started. But somehow he made a deal. I know. With the White Walkers, the Night King probably in particular. So that shows you that they can be spoken to somehow to come to an agreement. If I lay my sons out here in the snow, you don't fuck with me and I'll, and I'll call you my God or whatever. Because he said right with the gods. Yeah. And he, he meant the White that. Walkers. Yeah. So that shows you that they can come to the bargaining table for however that happens. Yes. So... If we envision how that happened the first time, they come up to his place, they're ready to kill him and everybody like they do everybody. Yeah. And he does what? Uh, just holds out a baby boy? Yeah, he happens to be holding and, it. And, and then, no, they, they, there's or, something or, there, Or maybe though. he's you know running through the woods and, and drops his kid or something, and they pick it up and they don't, don't come after him. I mean, I think their language is, un, I don't think a human can understand it. No. So it's something happened to make him realize, wait a minute, if I if I lay a, a baby down here, you know, they'll leave me alone. So I think the timeline would kind of fit as far as when they became active again, as far as 14 years, you know, by the time they show up in our story, to have built up a number of White Walkers. We saw a total of 13 in the show. The 14th was that Craster's son that he turned. And so we don't really know how many they are, but they do imply that there's a lot less of them than, of course, the whites. There's hundreds of thousands of whites. So I think it fits with the timeline with them, you know, getting busy up in the, the lands of Always Winter where they apparently were driven back to. Yeah. And then getting south and starting to fuck with the wilding groups that were still separated under different, you know, little tribes or whatever you want to call it. And gives them time to start making their presence known again in the north. Do you think, like... Let's kind of, and it may seem silly, but let's kind of compare it to the Bible. Yeah, I mean, they pull a lot of stuff from it. You know, when they say when Jesus was born, the star appeared in the sky that guided. Right. Do you think something, say when John was born, there was something. Yeah, I thought about that, that too. That happened. I, I, I that let them know, oh, hey. Well, you know? I, because I thought about that too based off the bleeding star we all saw in season one, episode 10, and then the beginning of season two when the dragons were hatched. Mm -hmm. You know, the bleeding star, the comet went across the sky and everybody saw it. Um, Osha tells Bran that it only means one thing, boy, dragons. John was already born then. That was when Danny hatched her dragons. But what if that thing was around. 14 years ago. Now, we didn't see it in the show. I think they would have showed us that. What about... Yeah. We saw a bleeding star in the sense of Dawn, the sword, a star forced from a meteorite. It was bleeding from all the fighting going on, and then he laid it beside a bloody bed. So you have Danny fitting that literally, and then John fitting that figuratively. But what if, you know, something like that happened? Or my thinking is this, because Bran went to his vision. Mm -hmm. He saw the Night King and the Four Horsemen. Yeah. Right? And he was able to see Bran and touch him. Then he is linked 
in that sense for magical stuff too, just like the children and Blood Raven and everybody in the magical ice camp. I, li- I like that. So maybe he knows. Yes. When a Stark is born or what have you, or, or he, and knew that maybe they have their own prophecies. He's already seen the the vision that Brand's just seeing. Maybe right. He so, saw the right. Tower of Joy maybe scene he already. somehow has that ability to see things through Werewood.net. You yeah. Know, we don't know anything about him, and we have no POV chapters in the books. You know, a lot of people had speculated. Well, maybe they're not the bad guys. Well. They may not be completely bad guys. They're reacting to something. But when we see what they're doing, they're pretty damn evil. I mean, they're killing innocent people, you know, wildlings to start with, for no yeah. apparent reason other than just to come take over. When, and, but they were created out of vengeance. That's what I was going to say. When they were re- initially made by the Children of the Forest, it was for they were just there to be bodyguards, basically. Yeah, yeah, they were going to fight for them. Hired muscle. And it looks like they never actually did that because they came up with a pact in the God's Eye on the Isle of Faces with the children, the first men did. And then there was peace. Okay. Then they said, okay, you can have the deep woods. We'll take these areas and we won't cut down any more weirwood trees. That was the pact. And they said, okay, let's do it. No more fighting. We're getting tired of you know all this bullshit. But then the walkers came after the fact. So that means they had already created them and maybe they had to have time to, to build up more or reproduce or whatever the hell happened. Then they showed up after there was already a peace agreement. So they went rogue and they never really fought for them during the war, only right. after the war. So basically, I think that the children created these creatures that threw the seasons out of balance and then they fucked up because now they showed up later and they're after everybody. They turned on their masters but or you're, their creators. You're saying the children, and, and this is your guess, I guess, the children only created one. Yes. that I, I think in the show so, uh, is what we're seeing. that They probably created one, and I think it'll probably go down the books like that. And we have to assume that one multiplied on its own. Right. And, and right. then when they kill somebody... They turn them into whites, but they multiply in another way to create another actual white, white walker. walker. Right. You have never seen in the show or read a white walker being created other than that one. Right. So other than just that one child being touched on the cheek, essentially, with his fingernail and his eyes turning blue... And that was in the land of always winter on that little altar you know, with the stones around there, like Stonehenge kind of looking that, place. That, That's the only way we know. Now, there's another hint about the Night's King, the tale about that, that you'll never see in the show. Is this the 13th? Right. Um, so it's indicated that there was at least one female White Walker, perhaps the Queen Bee. That's what I think we need to think about. Right. Talk on. So, so tell that story real quick. The, the, so the basics of of that story of the Knights King is that he was the 13th Lord Commander of the Knights Watch. Just like John was. Just like John. John is the 998th to put it in perspective, I think, right? Okay, damn. So, that's been a long time. Yes. And he, it says that he fell in love with a woman whose skin was as cold as ice and had eyes as blue as stars or, or something to that effect and get, fell in love with her and when he gave her his seed, he gave her his soul. So that implies, you know, a union between man and White Walker. Yes. Then he took her as his queen and ruled over the Night Fort for 13 years. Another 13, right? We have all these 13s when regards to, you know, the last hero and the Night's King. 13 years, 13th Lord Commander. And then he basically ruled over the Night's Watch for 13 years in the Night Fort when it was still an actively manned castle. And apparently they found out that he was giving sacrifices to the to the gods, which we assume are babies through the Black Gate. And this is the same gate that Bran went through going north and Sam went through going south with cold hands and all that kind of stuff. So that implies there was at least at one time a female. Now apparently they were defeated by the rest of the Night's Watch and at the time the King Beyond the Wall, Jorman, and they overthrew this Night's King and his queen and apparently killed them, we don't really know, but then they erased everything from history as far as who he was, what his name was, but old Nan says it was a Stark of Winterfell. So, where are we going with all this ice stuff? I think that somehow the Starks are connected 
to the White Walkers in some way, shape, or form, I think winter is coming is a warning. Now, this it's lost its meaning over thousands of years. Like, yeah. hey, the snow's coming. Yeah. But in the old days, winter is coming, I think, literally meant, you know, the ice demons are coming because they bring the cold. And I promise you, friend, the true enemy won't wait out the storm. He brings the storm. They definitely bring they the cold. They definitely bring the cold, too, because you hear in the books, in the books the show. Come, oh, all of a sudden you can start seeing their breath right. better and stuff. Uh, I mean, it's harder to breathe. And right. And Tormund tells John in the books about when they're near. You know when they're near because you'll wake up to find dead people that died of cold. Yeah. Um, it's hard to breathe. You know, it, can't, it hurts to breathe, and you, you don't know cold, you know, that type of thing, even though they're cold year-round up at the wall. What are your thoughts on the on the how strong you think the possibility is that there was that one female yeah i think there's I, I think there's definitely something to it because i don't think we would hear that story without it meaning something okay because when we were talking the other night we touched on her and then and then we were touched we you touched on there's got to always be a stark in winterfell right right and, and we're thinking that maybe she or her corpse or something is there and kind of kind of yeah, talk about that uh, the, a little bit. The, so the idea is and, and this is and let me say this some of these topics and speculation is I can't say they're all my ideas because you know I've read you know I, I try to stay off forums and stuff now yeah since I've gotten to YouTube but a lot of these ideas have been on the Reddit forums and other Ice and Fire forums and stuff for a long time. A lot of these ideas and, and, and speculation. So and you don't theories. know what's original anymore. So I don't anymore. know what's original anymore, honestly. So I don't so want much to take credit into for this. yeah. I don't want to take credit for anything by any means because I know this particular thing we're about to talk about. I know I've read online, but the other things I really don't know. So I don't want to take credit for something that's not mine. But there was. Uh, I, I, when we were talking about this the other night, I went and looked, and I did find some of these similar, you know, things. Okay, cool. The idea is that you know they erased all this stuff from from history, mm -hmm. and it could have been the Starks having influence over that, like erasing their bad name. Because I was thinking that too. You know, it could have been Brandon the Builder or whatever ended up being this evil, you know, Knights King. I don't think we hear that story for nothing, right? I mean, there, it implies that there was a female and. If there's a female, perhaps they're, you know, they used to be able to reproduce in a normal way. Right. Before they needed sacrifices. So if the Knights King married the Knights Queen, and then we heard later on that he was making human sacrifices, perhaps that's the reason why. Perhaps, you know, that took away their ability to reproduce and they started doing the first human sacrifices through the through the Black Gates, and that's why they can no longer reproduce, because she was killed. Or Another, uh, I know a lot of people have the theory that her soul or being or what have you is in the crypts of Winterfell. Okay. There's definitely something going on in the crypts of Winterfell. Throughout the books, John has horrible dreams about the, the crypts of Winterfell. He always goes down to the crypts and it's dark and he's walking, you know, he's being called to the crypts. In his dreams? In his dreams. Okay. And he feels like He's afraid of something, but he says implicitly that he's not afraid. He says something like, the old kings of winter down there with their dire wolves and their swords on their laps, but that's not what I'm afraid of. So what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So a lot of people have speculated or have theories that perhaps this knight's queen is trapped somehow in the, in the crypts of Winterfell because it's not in the show where it's just like one level. You know, and you see some some holes to each side with tombs. It's it's a lot of levels in the books. Well, let me ask you this, just real quick. Does that make it even cooler then that it happened to be John, who was that baby, because he was taken by Ned and raised in Winterfell. He has to have intimate knowledge of Winterfell right. and the crypts and everything to even make him more the right one to. To know all yeah, that. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's he's a Targaryen. He's a he's a dragon raised by wolves. God dang, that's a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, I just saw that quote a, a couple weeks back, and I thought that was awesome. That is good. All right, so that'll do it for part one of a dragon raised by wolves. To kind of quickly wrap this up, we've talked about the Knights King. Yep. Uh, the story about the Knights King and the Knights Queen. 
We've talked about the original Night King being created by the children of the forest and John's connection to the ice side of the magical side of things, right. not just being a Stark and a Targaryen. So uh, we'll uh, leave it there for now for part one to keep these kind of short, or at least shorter than they would be if we just went on all night long because we could. We'll pick up in part two right where we left off and continue talking about the connection to ice and fire and what John's end game is going to be. But as usual, thanks for all the support you guys. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.